Brad Shepard from Hoodoo Gurus. Welcome to Australian Musician. Thanks, Greg. Thanks for having me. Uh, 2022, uh, Hoodoo Gurus are finally getting to play uh, some decent gigs this year um, after the uh, pandemic and not being able to do much. Um, were you able to keep your chin up and, and keep your chops up during the, the lockdowns? Oh, sure. Um, that was not really a concern. It was more just about the fact that we had a bunch of shows that were slated for last year that had to be, you know, our, our entire uh, schedule had to be recalibrated. Yeah. Um, but that's okay. Um, it seems like Things are we're starting to get things across the line now. So, yeah, you, you've got some great gigs coming up. Uh, you've got one with Midnight Oil. You've got the Dandy Warhols tour. Um, you've got Blues Fest. I, I assume you've played Blues Fest before. Never. No. Okay. They never asked us. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we're not real. Really, we're not really a blues kind of act. You know, I still think of us as being a punk rock band. And I think that, you know, to most folks, that's fairly evident. Um, but um, happy to turn up and see what it's all about. Yeah. yeah. You must have played to some huge crowds over the years. Or what are some of the bigger crowds you've played? I remember playing in Tijuana once as part of a festival. That was bananas. And I honestly don't know how many people were there, but it was, I think it was a racetrack. Right. That was in the mid-80s mid uh, with a bunch of other acts that were popular in Southern California. Um We've been fortunate that we've been able to participate in kind of large outdoor events through much of our career. So um, I haven't counted heads, but <laughs> we did a show with um, uh, with Cold Chisel a couple of years back at the what was then the new Bank West Stadium in Sydney, and that was uh, that was significant. Yeah, of course, the, the opposite of that, uh, you must, must have played to some bizarre locations as well. Uh, some well, you know, you soup around on YouTube, there is one that we played in um Finland in 1987, and that too was an outdoor event, but it was within a hair's breadth of the Arctic Circle, and um. Curiously enough, Lindy Morrison from The Go-Betweens was interviewed recently in a, perhaps The Guardian and was relating to the night before that show when we had all played a bunch of us, uh, a bunch of bands had performed at um, the Roskilde Festival, which is where? Denmark, I think. Um, uh and yes, there was there was some consternation <laughs> uh, late night in the hotel, and it's an amusing story. I won't go into details, but uh, Lindy only saw maybe half of it because then we had like an hour's sleep, had to get on a commercial flight to fly to Helsinki, then a. a a light plane to fly north and then to the furthest, most northern airport, get off that plane, get on a bus, continue driving north, and then we found ourselves in the middle of a field somewhere with, I don't know, a couple of hundred people, a couple of hundred uh, Finnish punks, uh, and we'd had like an hour's sleep. So... That show is, um, you can watch that on YouTube, Hoodoo Gurus, you know, Finland, 1987. And, you know, in the moment, it still gives me a headache to think about the state we were in 
when we played that show. We were so sleep deprived, just hallucinating from lack of sleep. Um, we seem to play okay <laughs> on the show, on the on the video. Uh, uh, it doesn't truly reveal the the mental state we were in as a yeah uh, collectively we were all delirious. Yeah, I'll have to look that one up. Um, fast forward to two thousand twenty-two. You've got a new album coming out on March eleven, Chariot of the Gods. Um, were you able to approach this album? the way you would normally approach albums? Uh, pretty much. It, it was kind of business as usual in many regards for the Hoodoo Gurus. Dave has a song on this album called Carry On, and I, I, I believe it can probably be interpreted in a couple of ways. Uh, there's some subtext in that song, but I think generally it's about kind of what we do, roll up your sleeves and get on with the task at hand. Uh, so yeah, that's what we, that's what we did. Um, I kind of missed the old days when you could just, you know, book out Trafalgar Studios in Annandale or wherever. We, we recorded at Trafalgar a lot or the old, uh, the old uh, three, EMI 301 in Castlereagh Street. Um, it seems like we record infrequently these days and studios come and go in that in those intervening periods of time. And so you have to kind of snoop around and try and find a, a facility that might accommodate us. Uh, mercifully, we found, um, we found a, a, facil a facility that worked for us, um, Hercules Studios uh, in Surrey Hills, which is operated by Harry Vander. So that worked out pretty well for us. Um, uh, uh, our engineer, Wayne Connolly, had had some experience at that place, so he recommended it and seemed cosy enough. Yeah. You've got two songwriting credits on the album, a track called Equinox, another one called I Come From Your Future. Um, tell me how those two songs came about. Uh, I come from your future. D uh, Dave and I both wrote songs addressing similar subject matter, um, which is occupation by advanced civilizations. And I will be the first to admit that mine is the least intellectual of the two. Mine's just a dumb rock and roll song with 50s sci-fi sort of um, stenciled over <laughs> across what we do, which is we come to your town and take no prisoners. <laughs> that's kind of, that's our agenda. So that's that's really what's going on in, in my song. And Dave's much more serious and cerebral than that. And then uh, um, uh, we've been playing both of these songs um, live and I've been prefacing that song by saying it's about finding yourself in the wrong place at the wrong time. Uh, and then Equinox is about being in the right place at the right time. Uh, there are some extra tracks which only appear on the vinyl version of the album. Uh, did you have many tracks available that you were playing around with? There, are, there were a couple of songs that were in the part of the rehearsal process um, that didn't pass muster in the final assessment. Um, you know, most, mostly because we were running out of time and they just hadn't found their place uh, in the uh, arrangement process through rehearsal. You know, I think the songs, if, if we'd had more time and 
had uh, applied ourselves more diligently, we might have been able to um, to get them uh, up to match fitness. But we had enough songs already, so they just fell by the wayside. Just a couple of things we were working on, you know. And you, you don't know. You just sort of go into rehearsal and knock them around and see what happens. And some of them present themselves in sharper focus than others. Uh, on March 10, the day before the uh, album release, we've got a global live stream. Um, how are the new songs shaping up live? Are there some that are you're enjoying more than others? Uh, uh, mercifully, they're all coming together. I was terrified by the idea of doing this because really when we recording the album, I personally could have used some more rehearsal. That's just, I like to be confident in what I'm doing. And um, I frankly barely knew how to play these songs when we recorded them. And then you, you know, they, they haven't, uh, they haven't impacted enough in your memory that you can uh, recall them uh, with any great clarity. Uh, uh, consequently, uh, you know, uh, it, it was it was troubling to me that we were going to have to then perform these songs that that I really didn't I had but a tenuous grip on um, in a live stream. But um, I've been uh, just rehearsing quietly at home, <laughs> so I don't disgrace myself. Uh, uh, and um, it seems like it's going to come together. I'm actually much more confident now than I was in like November when we had started talking about doing this. So uh, um, I'm quietly confident now. Yeah. Uh, you've got Nick Reith on drums, who's reasonably new to the band. Does it take a bit of adjustment getting to getting used to somebody new in the band? It does. It's a little strange. Um, Mark Kingsmill, our former drummer who had been with us for decades, has a fairly distinctive style. And I think his style sort of dictated the tone of the band in many regards. So for a while there, and you know, with all difference to Nick, I'm sure, he, I'm sure he, uh, he will appreciate uh, my meaning but it felt a little bit like we were in a um, cover band uh, when he first joined the group, that there was an adjustment. It's like, it doesn't, I know I'm playing these Uru Guru songs, but it doesn't feel like us, but we've settled in and Nick brings uh, positive new characteristics to what we do. Uh, he's actually been playing with us more or less for five or six years now for a brief period Kingsley thought he might want to come back to the band so we did some shows with him and then he decided no he was right the first time he doesn't want to play anymore um so nick stepped back in um but i don't even think about it anymore it's just it's just the hoodoo gurus now i'm i'm their styles are not that dissimilar in many regards i think that's kind of what made Nick the right guy for us is that it felt the most natural to us compared to anyone else that um, that we rehearsed with. Um, it seems completely natural now for Nick to be there. Yeah. And he's a great guy. He's just a phenomenal bloke. He's a good guy to have around, good guy to, to be on tour with. That's always, you know, that's always part of the story is um, how long you can spend in a Tarago with someone that's, that's crucial <laughs> when you're in a band. Yeah. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the guitars you used on this new album. Um, anything new or did you use many guitars on the album? Not really. I mostly stuck to... Uh, Gibsons, Les Pauls and SGs. Um, 
that's very much my stock in trade. On a couple of songs, I used uh, uh, a Gretsch or two, but mostly it was very much my standard setup. Yeah. So what are you using these days? What's, what's your stage rig? I've been using uh, one of the old, well, oh, I've got a couple of them, but uh, Fender Tone Masters, not the new ones. I guess the new ones, there's like a digital variation, like a modeling kind of amp that has that same badge, Tone Master. These are the, you know, the old ones from the early 90s. Um, they've been my stage amp ever since they were available. I think I got them in 94. I have a couple of them. Um, I only use one on uh, when we perform and then there's just a backup sitting there. Um, I use that a lot. Um, in the recording process, we have often relied on AC30s, boxes for, um, for decades, since the 80s, I guess that we have found them to be a good recording amp and we certainly utilize those. My, um, my uh, secret weapon is an old HH head. It's um, solid state. Uh, and I guess that was the amp that um, bands in the UK favored through the 70s. I think it's called a C100. When I was a kid, I had a combo variation of that with two 12s in it. And I always enjoyed playing that amp as a, you know, as a kid, you always want to upgrade. I'm sure you know that story. Like you're not really satisfied until you've got a, you always want to trade in your Ibanez for a Gibson, at least I did, you know, and, uh, and, and likewise, as much as I enjoyed that HH, you know, you're always looking to upgrade to a Marshall so you would trade it in on other stuff. And it's not always the best idea, um, but I love that amp. I had that amp. Uh, I was in a like a high school punk rock band in the late 70s uh, called The Fun Things, and we recorded an EP uh, that came out in like 1980 or something like that. But that's the amp I used for that, uh, this HH thing, a uh, solid state uh, amp. And then many years later, I found one secondhand, just the head, the, the standalone head. And uh, I have employed that on uh, significantly on this record and, uh, you know, on previous records too, at the very least on, on the last one, Purity of Essence. Uh, it, uh, I don't know if it has a good sound but it has a unique sound and it's the sound of um like the suite would use hh amps uh on their recordings um mark bolan used hh uh on t-rex records they were certainly his um uh part of his live rig that he would use those amps and then the buzzcocks used hh amps a lot as well um, but it's cool. It actually has a surprisingly organic sound for a for a solid state amp. It's fun, and if you if you if you blend that in with something else, that you can perhaps coax some interesting tones yeah. out of the rig. Well, what's your approach to guitar solos in the studio? Is it something you work hard at? Maybe take notes, or is it more about just capturing a feel? Uh, though it would be my preference to do it that way. That's my natural inclination to actually sort of compose a solo. Um, often I'm put in a position where um, I have to just kind of improvise something and that scares me. I would prefer to be more, uh, more prepared than that. Um, um, but largely on this record, um, they're mostly improvised and in the hoary old, uh, kind of Jimmy Page fashion, I would just play a bunch of them and then a, a solo would be assembled 
out of all the best bits. <laughs> that's uh, that's often how it worked on this record. Yeah, you played uh, in other band side pro projects like the Monarchs and Persian Rugs. Will we ever see a Brad Shepherd solo album? Uh, I have no plans to do that. <laughs> Uh, no plans at all to do that. So I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Um, I can't imagine that I could uh, muster enough enthusiasm for that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, over the years, uh, Huda Guru has had a lot of uh, fans internationally, some high profile musicians like Joey Ramone used to come and see you play and uh, Iggy Pop, um, I wonder if you can tell me about the time Jimmy Page was watching you. I didn't actually see Jimmy Page. This is a story that is related to me by our manager. And I think it was at the Ritz in New York. Um, must have been at the end of 85, because I believe the song we were performing was like our wipeout. And at the end of that song, there's kind of like a Yardbirds rave up at the end of it. And so, you know, that was, uh, that ticked all the boxes for Jimmy Page. And uh, he, he apparently was, uh, became highly animated at this rave up at the end of like, wow. Um, and, and was so animated that um, he almost fell off the balcony of the, of, uh, at the Ritz. Uh, and I don't know if someone grabbed him or I, I don't know what the story is, but um, it was it was a while ago. But our, our manager related this particular incident to us, you know, later that night. Um, uh, so, you know, I guess if you're doing a Yardbirds rave up and Jimmy Page is so excited, they nearly fell off the balcony. You're probably doing something right. <laughs> Um, you've got this new album. Uh, with each new album, does it make it harder or easier to create a set list? It doesn't really impact on us, only because we're so long in the tooth uh, with such an extensive catalogue that um, there are <laughs> immaterial of what's on the new album there are certain songs that we must perform anyway. So there's only a couple of windows through in any set where we might be able to swap something out. Um, but, you know, if we don't play What's My Scene or Bittersweet or A Thousand Miles Away or Come Anytime, um, I'm sure we'll hear about it in the comments so, so uh, we uh, we're we're really only limited to maybe two or three spots in any set where we can swap out something fairly recent for us and replace it with something, uh, you know, from from our latest batch of songs. Yeah. So, what's left for the Hoodoo Gurus to achieve? I, I, I really don't know. I don't know what the future holds for this band. Often I think, you know, listen, actually, since Mars Needs Guitars, the, it seemed that the sword of Damocles is dangling over the head of the band and it could finish any time, but here we are 40 years later. So uh, um, I don't know. I don't know, if we keep playing well and we're enjoying ourselves, then uh, let's see where we get to. It's kind of curious now what might, what might happen. I have no idea. It seems that uh, many bands have come and gone in that period of time that we have just kind of, uh, you know, we just kind of keep on keeping on. Yeah. So um, I, I honestly don't know. I mean, it's preposterous to think of us, you know, we're all, we're, you know, I don't, 
it's no secret. Yeah, we've been around for 40 years. We didn't start when we were five years old. So um, <laughs> we're uh, we're starting to get on there. But I don't know. We we when we get on stage and we are focused at what in, in what we do, um, then we seem to still deliver. Uh, and as long as we can do that then um, we, we may just continue to do our thing. Yeah. Well, what we do know for sure is that Chariot of the Gods, uh, another great Huda Guru's album, is out on March 11. And uh, Brad, it's been fantastic to catch up. Thanks, Greg. Much appreciated.